Why is testosterone so controversial? I'm convinced that if testosterone had a different name, if you could take the molecule testosterone, rebrand it, call it, um, like with these peptides, right? With the numbers, right? <laughs> right? Like you would call it molecule one, two, three, four, five. And you did a study and you showed all the different things that testosterone could do for you. People would say, this is the second coming. We got to get on this for our health. But testosterone comes with a lot of baggage. Everybody thinks they're an expert on testosterone. You don't have to be medical. Oh, yeah. Right? Wall Street Journal, so, so the market goes up and there's like a feeding frenzy. What do they say? The traders were filled with, there was a, a filled with testosterone today on Wall Street. <laughs> no, they weren't, right? But yeah. it's a concept. We think of testosterone, we think of cheating athletes. Mm -hmm. We think of bodybuilders. We think of toxic masculinity, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Harvey Weinstein and, and all that stuff. Testosterone, testosterone is a bad person. We have testosterone. Men and women have testosterone. All of us do. Mm -hmm. And it plays a imp really important role in our biology. And it's not just us. It's almost every vertebrate species. Anything with a backbone has testosterone. Right. Fish. <laughs> right? Yeah. We all have it. And it's critical for, for how our biology and our health. And as testosterone levels decrease as we get older, we not only have symptoms, but we're less healthy. We're less healthy. With more fat, you know, our lipids go off, livers can get fatty, our immune system is suppressed. Um, it's not good. And testosterone has actually shown benefits in terms of inflammation, glycemic control, and heart health. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's almost like a, a sociological experiment to look at what the data are, what the facts are, and then the attitudes of many in the medical community. So a lot of people now get their testosterone from what might seem like less than uh, reputable sources, right? So there's, most towns and cities have uh, uh, one or more testosterone clinics mm -hmm. somewhere in a, a less fancy part of town, <laughs> right? Rents are cheaper. And the docs who hold themselves to these very high standards, they think of themselves as academic or you know, these, this is the key medical practice in town. They look at the practices on the edge of town and they look down their nose at them and they say, those guys are shady. Mm -hmm. I've done a cut. I do some medical malpractice, expert witness stuff around testosterone. You, it's the scenario is always the same. Somebody was started on testosterone and then later on something bad happened, right? Heart attack, stroke, prostate cancer. But what's interesting is that um, quite a few of these of the people who are being sued are these docs from the smaller practices at the edge of town. And there's an underlying theme in these cases where people did not believe that they were reputable. But why are they out there practicing is because in many cities, you can't find a doctor to prescribe testosterone to you. Mm -hmm. Exactly because some of the docs think it's disreputable. Why do you think that it's so difficult to convince a primary care doctor or even a urologist yeah. at times that testosterone is safe and effective and a, a viable treatment option? Yeah, I'm giving a talk in a couple of weeks on this. But what, why do you think? I mean, I think that one, there's a lot of misinformation that's been um, touted, which we've hopefully made ways in improving with the Traverse trial, which I've talked about on my channel before. I think that misinformation led to a lot of fear of heart disease, of of uh, blood clots, of strokes, and uh, when in the reality is is far from that. I think people are scared of of doing something they're not comfortable with. I've spoken and <laughs> interviewed unofficially quite a number. The, the main resistance comes from the academic endocrinologists. And the most amazing thing is that sort of at the top of that food chain, if you will, where the information comes from, the folks who run the, like the guidelines for the endocrine society, and I know many of them, and they're good people, solid people, they've done the research, most of them, that has been most impactful in terms of showing how good testosterone is and how safe. Mm -hmm. And yet, when they get up in front of a microphone and talk about cases or whether somebody should treat, they're almost all negative. I've been in rooms with a couple of these people where we're waiting for something to start and they're sharing cases and they're competing with each other about how low somebody's testosterone was and yet they declined to treat. It's like a badge of honor for them. So 
it's a, a very bizarre thing. And I have a couple of thoughts about it. Um, but what happens is that, um, you know, with medicine, it's, it's hard to practice medicine. There's so much information, right? Whatever field you're in, mm -hmm. you're bombarded by information. You're supposed to keep up with the latest and the newest. You have a ton of patients. You have to make it through your day. You got to pay all of that, right? Yeah. So you can't be an expert on everything. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. So what do we do is we, we defer to those we trust. And there's a couple of different kinds of trust. One is people. So they're the people that seem the most knowledgeable, and they're often the authors of these studies. And the other is often we defer to journals or other sources, um, not all journals, but some journals we say, if it's published in this journal or that journal, it's got to be reputable, mm -hmm. right? And so they've gotten somebody to write an editorial about it. That person, the journalist selected that editorialist. They really got to know their stuff. And sometimes they're just wrong. Yeah. And a lot of this is groupthink. This isn't exactly it, but it's related is that we've come to a place now. You mentioned the Traverse trial. So for, for your listeners, the Traverse trial is the largest ever randomized controlled trial of testosterone by far. So until now, the largest one was 1,000 people, and this one was over 5,000. It's a big deal. And it, as clearly as anyone could ever show in medical research, no increase in heart disease with testosterone and heart attack, stroke, or death. No increase in prostate cancer. Prostate cancer has sort of been where I've been fighting the good fight for all these years. And it turns out, and I mentioned Huggins in 1941, we're 80 years into this. And the whole thing is BS. <laughs> There's one part that's true and everything else is wrong. The one part that's true is, is that if you deprive prostate cancer of androgens, of testosterone-like substances, uh, the cancer will shrink. That's true. Yep. And they have these super agents now, like uh, we call it ADT, androgen deprivation therapy. They have these new agents, I call them super ADT. They lower testosterone even more. People have longer lives. They have longer progression without advance in, in their cancer. True, true, true. What's not true is that raising testosterone is a problem. Right. It's taken me until this day, I started this in 1988, it's taken me until now, 2024, for me to say to you with confidence that there's not one part of that story that's true. Before I would always say, well, I don't think it's true in this group of men that I treated. And then I'm like, I went to a slightly riskier population. It wasn't true in them either, but I don't know yet about like metastatic cancer or whatever. Well, I've now treated men with metastatic cancer with, with testosterone and nothing special happened to them. All we, I was taught that these people would die within days to weeks if we raised testosterone. No, it didn't happen. And now we have Traverse that shows in 5,000 men, followed for an average of 33 months, that the rate of cancer was identical in both groups, testosterone or placebo, and the number of high-risk cancers or high-grade cancers, which are the ones now that we know to worry about, first of all, was extremely low in both groups, but they're almost the same number also. Right. It doesn't do it. And what a lot of people, including urologists, don't fully appreciate, but I think is really important, is this. So what does that study show? It shows that they didn't develop, they weren't diagnosed with prostate cancer. When I started this crazy <laughs> adventure of mine years ago, offering testosterone to people, and, and I got in a lot of trouble around this too. And one of the things that, that was going on was I lost my train, my train of thought, but we'll get there. So I used to biopsy men with testosterone. Before I gave testosterone, I was so afraid that I was going to risk having a hidden cancer grow that I did biopsies. I ran into, a, um, into one of my former teachers at the AUA, mm -hmm. our national urology meeting. You know, we have se several hospitals and one residency program. And the residents tell all the doctors at the other hospitals what everybody else is doing, yep. right? <laughs> so there's no secrets. And I would talk in the operating room about my guys. I was on testosterone, how good it was. And so I see one of my, one of my former teachers from another hospital. He says, hey, I understand from the residents you're giving testosterone. I say, that's right. It's so good. They have this benefit, that benefit. He says, stop. <laughs> you have to stop what you're doing. You're going to give these guys cancer. I said, well, what are you talking about? It hasn't happened to me. He said, I heard about what you were doing, so I decided to give one patient testosterone. His PSA went up. I biopsied him. 
He has cancer. <laughs> so you better stop what you're doing. And we talked for another little bit. I wasn't going to stop because the, the benefits were so incredible. He said, well, if you're not going to do it, then I suggest you biopsy the prostates of all these guys before you give them testosterone. Now, that was a time, you're not going to believe this. We used to do biopsies without anesthesia. Mm -hmm. It was very unpleasant. Like even without local? And without local. Oh, gosh. There was this belief, and it's amazing how medicine, so many of the things that we tell ourselves <laughs> turn out to be garbage, but we tell ourselves anyway. So we didn't, we, we used to think, there's no good way to anesthetize the prostate. And most of the guys tolerated, but it was really unpleasant for them. And not everybody was, and so I started doing this though. I started, I would say to the guys who had low levels of testosterone, they wanted to be on it. I said, I can give it to you, but we have to make sure your prostate's fine. I'm worried about prostate cancer. And I was. Not all of them were willing to do a prostate biopsy, but many of them were. Mm -hmm. And that was the price of admission. And what we found was, the old story was that high testosterone was dangerous. Low testosterone was supposed to be protective. My training, part of the mythology of this whole thing was that eunuchs would never get prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, as a resident, I would say to my chief resident, I'd say, how do they know this about eunuchs? Because I didn't know any eunuchs. Yeah, I don't know any either. <laughs> it's always like this absolute thing. Like, how do they know this about eunuchs? And he said, oh, they studied the surviving Chinese eunuchs at the end of whatever, the Ming dynasty. I don't know. So that was a kind of BS answer, but that's what it was. But what we found out was that these guys were not protected at all. As a matter of fact, my first sort of big paper around any of this stuff was our biopsy results in our first 77 men. They had normal PSA, normal digital rectal exam. I was biopsying them only because they had low testosterone and they wanted to go on treatment. And I wanted to make sure they didn't have cancer. These guys should have had a cancer rate of zero. Yeah. But what we found is that one out of seven had cancer. And at the time, this was with only the six cores. Now you do usually minimum of 12, you do imaging, mm -hmm. targeting something. These are random biopsies, just six little pieces. 15% had cancer. And we published that in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. We only had 77 men, but 11 of them had cancer. Wow. And we followed it up with another paper in 345 men. Um, and so we have over 400 men. The numbers are the same. And we know now from other prostate cancer studies, that, like the PCPT, that there's a lot of prostate cancer in men with a PSA less than four. Going back to Traverse, it's not just that they didn't have more cancer mm -hmm. diagnosed. It's that 15% of those men already had cancer in their prostates that wasn't detected. They're walking around with it. Yeah. But those cancers also didn't grow. If they had grown with testosterone, like we were taught was supposed to happen, their PSAs would have gone up a lot. The doctors would have felt nodules. They would have had biopsies. They would have been diagnosed. So it's not only that testosterone doesn't cause new prostate cancers. It doesn't cause existing cancers to grow more than placebo did. That's powerful. That's really powerful. Yeah. So very few, you get it. Mm -hmm. Now that I've told you, yeah. your listeners will get it. And, and it's the reason that I now say with, with uh, as clearly as I can, I think that whole story ends up being uh, just bankrupt. We've been living under a fairy tale for 80 years. Well, and I think we're very oncocentric in medicine, meaning that cancer is so feared and so important to prioritize. And I think it is to some degree, but quality of life after a cancer diagnosis, especially in a young man or young woman, if she's got breast cancer or any sort of cancer that's hormone sensitive, is is really important to think about. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, for your listeners, sort of standard treatment for people with prostate cancer is bad, is they undergo treatment where we lower their testosterone, right? So we call that ADT or androgen deprivation therapy. And then we have these newer, I call them super, super ADT agents, lower it even more. And the effects on men are profound. There's some men who aren't bought, that bothered by it, but all, everybody loses their sex drive. Just about everybody loses their ability to have sex, but they lose muscle, they gain fat. A lot of men get diabetic. There are data that show there's increased cardiovascular risks. But you know, I, and I've had guys who 
had metastatic disease and who came to me and wanted treatment. I said, that was pretty scary even for me to think of that. I said, why do you want this? And I had one guy who said, I'm so weak that when I get in the shower, I can barely lift my arms to, to wash my hair. That's so sad. His wife is with him. So he's the, used to be the most outgoing guy in the world. He's got a gazillion friends. We'd go out every night. Now he's like a shut-in. Doesn't want to go out. He refuses to drive. He says, I don't feel up to it. That's quality of life. Like, and, and all these guys said, there's no point in my surviving longer in this state. Yeah. This isn't life. And that's what gave me the courage to treat these guys. And they would bounce back. And, and I told them they could die within days or weeks and, and, uh, and they accepted that risk. And I don't, we didn't, I published on, uh, about 20 of these guys. I don't think we shortened a day of anybody's life and their quality of life improved. They became people again. If you enjoyed this clip of the Rena Malik MD podcast, make sure you check out the full episode with Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler right here.